the uh, curious thing happened when this title was suggested. Part of the title was excluded. And the part that was excluded is that this title comes out of Chunnel, a very, very major thinker in the history of Buddhism in Korea. And the book that you should look for is Chunnel, The Korean Approach to Zen. <clears throat> Really, truly a great book. And the writings are of Chunnel sometimes. Uh, he's referred to in a, a series of ways, but in, in his full name is Chunnel. Now, um, Chunnel was a major thinker. He had so much insight into the whole tradition of Buddhism. Uh, how did I spell it? C H U. Excuse me. That should be I N U L. Chunnel. No. Um, an important point in his career as being a monk, <clears throat> he decided he had to separate himself from the whole traditions of Buddhism, and so he gathered all the major classics of Buddhism and he put them on several wagons and carted them off into the hills of Korea where he then studied nothing but the classics. And as a result of that, he did the great works that go under the name, the collected works of Chunnel, the Korean approach. Now, why is that significant? Well, <clears throat> since it's not part of the title, I'm not in any way obliged to deal with it. So either I can continue exploring Chunnel's thought, or we can just take the subject and explore it. So I will explore it. <clears throat> but I can't separate myself from the thought of Chunnel, since so much of what I think of Buddhism comes out of Chunnel and other works. But certainly Chunnel is one of the greatest exponents for me of the, what Buddhism really is. And I had the good fortune of working with a truly great master, Myobang, uh, Myobang Sinem. And he is in the patriarchal lineage, still, still living. And that means that he is that lineage that goes back to the Buddha. He is the 33rd patriarchal Dharma successor of the Buddha. His teacher was uh, Aeon, who lived to be 102 or three. And um, I was fortunate enough to work with him for several good years. And through him, he opened the doorway to Chunnel and many other important things. So let me talk about Buddhahood for a moment. That's a strange word. <clears throat> for Chunnel, he often, what I like about Chunnel is that he describes these terms in terms of our experience rather than in terms of a philosophical system. So he says, Buddhahood is when you're, when you're in a situation, perhaps meditating, and so thoughts come and go, thoughts come and go. He said, if even for one instant, however you do it, no thought arises, then you experience Buddhahood. The language he uses is a monist Buddhahood. A monist Buddhahood. Monist one. You experience the nature of Buddhahood as one. So that's the way he does it. He talks about it through experience. Now, the interesting thing that I like exploring is What is all of this human activity and quest for enlightenment if it's as simple as that? Or let's turn it around and say, since this is our everyday mode of existence, 
having thoughts and being plagued by thoughts or being controlled by thoughts or being influenced by thoughts or enjoying thoughts, whatever it might be. Why is the presence of this ignorance and this is enlightenment? Why is this the entry into Buddhahood? Now, the attainment of this is a direct understanding. That's a direct understanding of this. It's not merely the experience, but it's a direct understanding. So, the direct understanding of that this is the way it is, is this. Now, <laughs> Uh, walk over here and say, now, what does that mean about the other picture? I submit to you that it's the lack of understanding, it must be the lack of understanding, <clears throat> now, what is it that we lack? Understanding, okay, of what? Of what kind? And why should some simple difference make so much difference to mankind? Uh, this chalk doesn't think. No thoughts. Must be enlightened. Is it the mere absence of thought? That's what he says, if you could hold back. But you see, the difference between the two is that there is something going on here. There's something going on here that is totally obscured by the presence of this. Huh, huh. Let me, therefore, explore this with you, and let me raise a couple of questions and take you through your own understanding. That's what we're going to do this evening. Number one, when you have a thought, right now, when you have a thought, does the thought stand alone? Does the thought contain within it, or attendant with it, some image? If there is a thought, let's go further and say it has an image. Let's go further then and say that, is it not likely that you know very well the experience of a thought with an accompanying image that continues. It continues. And then at some point, for whatever reason, you come out of it. You see, at the moment when you come out of it, something very significant takes place. but we're not going to be able to appreciate it until we understand this. Huh. Would you agree <clears throat> that you can have a thought that continues and it's either unique, first time you have ever thought of it, and therefore, you should be surprised at its richness and newness. Or it's recycled. Or you've had it before. You see, if you had it before, then in some way, your mind is reminding yourself, 
Fine. Is playing it again. That is to remind. Now, suppose then we were to ask, is it equally likely that if you could watch this process, that you know very well you've had something like it, if not the very same thing previously? That is to say, you know, you had it before. Now, if you know you had it before, then why don't you terminate it? Well, go, let's go a step further. If you want to be inquisitive about the mind, Perhaps you can now engage this thought. Say, is it possible that something precedes that thought? Something precedes it. Something precedes it. That is extremely compact, compressed, seed-like, seed-like. And if you pay attention to the way your thoughts come up, just watch them. Don't bother trying to control or direct them. Is it not likely then that you might take an interest in knowing whether or not there is something that preceded the particular thought, any one of these, and that it has a seed-like quality. Now, if it has a seed-like quality, then you know the whole thing. You're aware of the whole thing. That is to say, you don't have to talk to yourself. You don't have to tell yourself anything. If it has a seed-like quality, in which is it already condensed and compacted, well, you can turn off this, I'm going to call this now, sub-vocal dialogue with yourself. Right. That sub-vocal dialogue that goes on. You can turn it off, because you know what's coming. You don't have to go through all that. Now then, if it's true that if you take a look at your own mind to see whether or not this is true or not, it raises a rather interesting question. Then why do we tolerate this verbalization, the sub-vocalization of something we already know? Here it comes again. Therefore, we can ask, what is going on here? That we endure, allow, tolerate, enjoy, doesn't matter. What's going on here? Because if we could terminate it, because we have the whole thing in a minuscule package, right, like a seed, well then, to allow ourselves to do that, there must be something that's going on. Because we do endure it, we allow it, we tolerate it, in some cases we may even enjoy this thought formation. Now what is it? Well, we do not agree. We have to add something to this. There is no thought, there is no thought with its image 
that doesn't have a certain right right certain tone to it. Our subvocal thoughts have a certain manner and style and tone to them. You can describe with great accuracy, if you take time out, that tonal quality of the thoughts. Those tonal qualities of the thought, if you explore just a bit further, are very likely to be connected with this image. So you have a thought you have an accompanying image, there's a certain tonal quality to the thought. It can go on for a certain period of time, it can continue. Because there's something else in it, as it continues, it has, right, it continues as a drama. That is to say, it has a content, it's going somewhere, it has a drama. If you allow it, it will become a fantasy, or parts of it. Well then, why do we ever wake up from it? Why do we ever wake up? How do we account for this? You see, the two things we have to try to describe. We have to describe, see, we have to describe the, the entrance into it. Why do we go into it? Why do we go into it? What's the first step, see? What's the first step? All right, what's the first step? And while that's interesting, it's not quite as interesting as this, how do we come out of it? I mean, if it's absorbed us, now you could say, well, we hear something from the external world that wakes us up. No, no, no. They were sounds in the external world before this that didn't wake you up. Must have occurred at a certain point. Try better. What if you were to set up the circumstances so that you will eliminate or reduce the possibility of such interruptions, then what wakes you up? Ah, oh, there's something missing, you see, there's still something missing. We don't have it yet. There must be another thing in here or it won't work. Somewhere in this, there has to be a image of you. There has to be either in the drama itself, or there has to be an awareness of watching the drama and enjoying it, but still, that awareness will still have a certain attitude and style. Now we have a little bit more. There you are, you're sitting, doing nothing. Therefore, you have an opportunity to just watch what comes up. And we're asking the following things. Is it likely that sooner or later, something is going to trigger this whole sequence? Seed-like. At first, that might be difficult to determine, but little practice you can get it. 
then you'll see that a thought emerges. It takes on a certain form. It can continue. It can propel itself. It has a kind of an autonomous existence. It can be directed to some extent, but then it takes on a life of its own. And you either become, in, become involved in it as a player, or you are that which watches it and enjoys it or suffers through it, which has its own attitude, style, and manner. Well, look here. This is the life of man. Then what is this response? Why do we ever come out of it? Why do we ever come out of it? Now, to play this, you really need to simply do nothing other than what you always do. Not asking you to do anything else. This is going to take place, isn't it? Just uh, direct your understanding to what is going on. That's all. No yoga, no fancy breathing, no mantras, tantras, nothing. What are you going to do? Just going to take a look at yourself. And you discover something quite interesting. This is the moment, invariably, hey, invariably, you realize that that image of yourself in this drama or your role watching it with all of those qualities is not you. Wake up. That is to say, that's the moment when you recognize you were fooled. You were fooled. You were conned. You were fooled. And here is a moment of waking up, isn't it? That's waking up. You wake up to the fact that that isn't you. That's not the, what you want to be and what you are. But that only occurs for the briefest of moments. That occurs in the most briefest of moments. Bang! And what happens? Another one may then take off. Or... What often happens is you may then call yourself all kinds of names for indulging in this curious activity. Right? That is to say, you'll judge yourself for having done that and allowed yourself to do it, wasting time and all of those things. <coughs> or you might judge the morality of the story. You were doing what? You were thinking what? Huh, you allowed this and that? Why, 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 why? So it turns against you, or a new one starts. It doesn't make any difference, still a new drama. It takes on the same form. But for a moment, you woke up. For a moment, you woke up. I woke up. You can wake up. That's a direct understanding that you aren't this image. In that briefest of moments, that's no thought. In that briefest of moments, that's no thought. That's enlightenment. That's Buddhahood. But it's so fast, twinkling of an eye. But it isn't any different than this pursuit on the highest level. Now look here, let's go back and see whether we can go back and ask our question again. What is it about these two states, the presence, the absence of a thought? It's not just the absence of a thought. If a thought involves all of this, when you have an absence of a thought, that means 
You see, anything that would even, even begin to emerge, see, that entree is this. The more you can become familiar with this little seed-like precursor to a thought and can grasp it, then it doesn't, play, it doesn't play itself out. Let's go further. For as long as this state, no matter how brief it is, what that means is that you are not you are not seizing it, right? You're not seizing it. You're not, that's it, you see. We're seizing on an image of the self. You can't have the fantasy, the thought, the daydream, unless you're willing to say that that tonality and that attitude and the style that you have is you. To the degree that you remove yourself from that, to that very degree, it's not going to function as a springboard into the thought realm. This is called in Shunnel the phenomenal world. This is the phenomenal world. This is the noumenal world, right? phenomenal, the way things appear. You see, this is the whole world of appearance. The whole mental panorama of the mind is the realm of appearance. Now, notice what we're saying. We're saying that once there is an identification with this as the self, That means we have grasped what we think is real. We think we are in touch with a reality, our own reality. Since that self with that aspect of reality has its own inherent properties, attitude, style, mannerisms, gestures, articulations of this and that and the other thing, right? which contains within itself an implicit drama that can then be unfolded in a series of thoughts, much like a movie script, which we then watch or identify with. What's missing? See, what's missing? What accounts for the difference between the two? You see, what's the difference between this and this moment of waking up? At this moment of waking up, <clears throat> it's reflective. We know we are not that image. We know we're not that image. It's recursive. It turns upon itself. It's recursive. It's aware of itself. I'm not that. I thought I was that. I'm not that. For that moment, it's recursive. You know that you know something. You know that you know something. Now look here, here. It isn't empty in that negative sense. It's an understanding, a direct understanding. It's a direct understanding that this is real, that this is reality. In that moment, right? There is no image, idea, form of self. There is an, an Atman, right? The Hindu concept, an Atman, no self. 
There is no self in that state. There is just what is. Just what is. And there's an awareness that it is. See? There's an awareness that it is. It's not unconscious. It's awareness that it is. True. Huh? What do you know? See, in, uh, <clears throat> in Zen Buddhism, especially in works like Three Pillars of Zen, Kaplo and other works, the uh, Yasatani Roshi often says, the basic problem of man, the basic sickness of man is thought. Thought is the... Thought is the sickness of the mind. Well, thought is the sickness of the mind. It's a very nice bumper sticker. And even though he repeats it many times, that is not what he means. Because it depends on what you mean by this very curious word, thought. I can give you an example. If you're driving down the highway, there you go, driving down the highway, and you say to yourself, I'm kind of interested in knowing whether I can see something without recognizing what it is I see. And when I recognize what it is I see, I wonder whether I can keep from knowing what it is that I see. Oh, so you're driving down the road, right? It's one of my favorite games. And you're driving down the highway. What is the, how, how do you play it? You play it this way, you see. You, t you, you have to keep your, driving skills right at a nice level, see, nothing, no music, nothing. So. You're driving along, and you're, you have your eyes open, right? And so you see the billboards, but you're not going to read them. Right? You're not going to read them, because that would be a thought. So you're not going to read them. Now, can you see the sign without reading it? Yeah, no, yes, what? Well... You see, can you look at a chair and not know that it's a chair? Can you look at the chair and not know it's a chair? When you know it's a chair, when you recognize it as a chair, is that a thought? Just what are we talking about when we say thought is the thick sickness of the mind? What are we talking about? Because thought is indistinguishable from recognition. And you can't see without recognizing what it is you see, unless you go around like that, then you can't see so in Three Pillars, there's a certain point where um, someone questions him about it, and they're in a, a private discussion, uh, dokusan, private interviews, time between the Roshi and the aspiring student or monk. And this issue comes up, and he says, look here, he says, I don't mean to say that all thought is the problem. He what I mean is all the systems of belief. That's the problem. That's the sickness of the mind. Well, then wait a minute. Then it's not thought is the sickness of the mind, but belief. Belief. Because you, look here, would you not agree you would never drive with a Roshi and let him drive because he couldn't drive the car without recognizing other cars on the road? And that recognition is intimately bound up with seeing, recognizing, knowing. So you can't be against thought as thought. So Yasutani goes in this very interesting section, and he corrects this. And he says, this is what, I, he says, I don't mind thought. He said, thoughts just naturally come up. He said, if your mind is working, you have thoughts. 
He said, don't worry about those, they come and go. It's when you add to it belief. Well, he didn't expand on the word belief too much. He said a couple of more things. He said, uh, belief is what men get caught into, you see. Conceptions they get caught into. See, but to get caught into is what we're talking about here. This is what we're talking about getting caught into. Now, <clears throat> what would it then be like? I want to raise the discussion another level now, all right? Okay? Suppose for the moment that you now go through this sufficiently so that you see from your own experience and confirm everything that's here on the board. All right. What will that do the next time you have a thought that has an image and a form? What will this reflection do to your own mental experience? It's going to do something. Because the more you see this way, it's building understanding, isn't it? To the degree then that you're able to see it take place, it's direct understanding. You're not creating theories about it. You're not listening to Pierre. You're not reading a book. You become your own teacher. You, you, you want to discover something about the operations of your own mind. How many time at the moment to go into books? Well, that will have an effect on this whole thing in the following way. You can now say, you know, I wonder whether or not this attitude and style that seems to be present or this image and form I adopt, either one, either one now, whether or not that attitude and style and tonal qualities to the formations that I'm watching and my thought patterns, wonder whether or not I have ever been exposed to that attitude, style, mannerism, and tone of voice of someone. Well, hey, you know what you're into now? Nothing special. You just want to see whether you can put from your own past a face on this from your own past. Now look here, suppose it turns out by doing this that you can say, by heavens, isn't that curious? That attitude is very much more like my Uncle Harry, my Aunt Mary. Now what does she what is her drama doing in my mind? You don't have to answer it. You don't have to answer it. Oh, by the way, you might then, might you not, take a look at this drama. You're not going to criticize it. You're going to allow it to go on. And you're going to then say to yourself, is that a curious drama? What theme is operating there? Now, what I'd like to do is have a, just a gentle, you know, just a, keep a, just a small little journal on the back of a napkin, right? Nothing fancy. And all I'm interested in is seeing if I can put a name on what kind of drama is going on here. Just what kind. That's all. What kind of a drama is it? Is there a recurring drama? Hey, I wonder how many dramas I have that account for most of the thought formations I go through. Huh. And then you can write, hey, this one had uh, getting caught. Oh. How often is getting caught a theme in my, in my daydreams? Oh. Being a victor, overcoming disasters, being a Joan of Arc, <clears throat> whatever. 
establish the theme that recurs behind the drama. Then when you have all this, the dramas, and all you're going to do then is get the particular themes and just check them off. You're not going to do anything complicated like try to stop it, right? Yoga, right? become fierce. All you're going to do is on this back of this napkin or letter, right, back of an old letter, make a note of what themes occurred. And how many people from your personal past have attitudes, styles, manners, and that tonal quality in their own voice that I can identify? So you're going to have a very interesting, we're going to call it the actor's file. Right? Mom, dad, whoever it might be. Right? Now, when you get this, just check them off. You're not, not changing anything. You're not taking any vows of celibacy. <coughs> right? Or agree not to eat meat. Right? No disciplines. No, all you're doing is watching, right? All you want to do is just understand what's going on in your own mind. And one more step now, all right? Now suppose these actors that you have identified with the particular themes you've identified in the dramas, actually have a source, appears to have a common source in your past. Some event that took place that keeps coming up. But you don't remember the particular event. You get these formations of it, this transformation of it. Because you know what? Maybe we only have a small number of themes, small number of our actors file. <clears throat> and suppose equally well, we only have just a small finite number of past scenes that echo, that are echoes and echo in the various forms and account for the thought formations in our mind. Well, look here. Then that suggests just one thing. What it suggests is that there's something in your past that you haven't finished reflecting on. You haven't understood. And it keeps coming up it keeps coming up as an object for your attention because it wants to be resolved. It's the mind presenting in its image form, in a mirror form, those most vital things of your past that you have yet to understand that are important to you for your own development. If that's the case, and you can, you can check this out without any trouble, then the mind, when you're at ease, is giving you an opportunity to see what yet needs to be clarified and understood. And if it does, is it likely that you may have come to some false understanding of this past event that you really didn't understand it. If you didn't understand it, it's because you, you understood it in a certain way that isn't understandable. And therefore, if, if you can review these past scenes freshly, it may be then that you might see that the conclusion you drew from those past scenes wasn't the only one. Uh, look here, it's 
it's worthwhile seeing whether this is the case because if you can see that your past experience you misunderstood and your mind is offering it to you for another look, then if you do understand it, you're going to drop that image, aren't you? <clears throat> that misunderstanding, and that's the same as this, isn't it? That's the same as waking up. Now, What is that showing, you see? Now, we have to take a look at this. If this is true, what is that showing? That's showing, then, that there's a profound dimension to our mental life that is offering us again and again the opportunity to redirect our energies, to try, try to discover things that we haven't fully understood and misperceived and misunderstood. If that's the case, and it's the very kinds of things that are key to our own development, well, then the mind is providential. It's giving you opportunities to see yourself most positively. Well, that means, therefore, your mind is pretty clever. Not only is it pretty clever, but suppose just grant one, one idea, that's all we need, one idea is all we need now, Suppose it turns out that um, when you see, understand, that this misunderstanding brought you to a certain false belief about yourself, which then working backwards, right, becomes a theme which is repeated again and again in your thoughts, that takes on figures in your daydreams or your in thoughts, what we call the actor's file, and plays out the themes of those very past scenes, then the mind is offering us the very conditions for our own growth and development. But suppose it goes further. I mean, suppose it turns out that by giving up those false thoughts about the self, you are purifying the mind of false images of the self. And that is Buddha. If that's the case, then the everyday mind is the Buddha mind. And what's going on is intimately concerned with your own growth and development offers you in the finest multimedia, right, multimedia event, isn't it, that you think is so real, man, you identify with it, you go with it, right? You even style your life in respect to it to some degree. And it does this amazing thing which just by reflection, just by reflecting and trying to understand it without any theories, You might see that in every way what the mind is doing is disclosing to you opportunities for breaking through by directly understanding that what you are experiencing is of such a nature that it binds you to a false image of yourself and therefore directly understanding that it is false directly realizing that it is false, we wake up. You can wake up here, you can wake up here. You can wake up when you recognize in a fantasy or a daydream that that's not me. For that split second, you're awake. Or if you go through this process at that moment when you give up those false ideas of yourself, what you're doing is purifying the self by using the mind itself. And it doesn't cost you a dime. Right? It doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to dress in any particular style. No robes, right? No vows other than maybe you have to take a look at what's going on in your own mind. 
Therefore, to see the nature of the mind or the Buddha mind, see Buddha is a title, it's, it, it's not a name, it's not a name of a person. Buddha is really Gotama, Buddha means the mind, mindhood, Buddha is mind, Bodhi comes from the word Bodhi, B-O-D-D-H-I, right? right? So what we're saying then is it's some, rather simple, isn't it, that uh, you can talk about enlightenment as this kind of event, you can see the mind or the Buddha mind in the moments of enlightenment, you can also see uh, Buddhahood and operations of our everyday mind. Same mind. Only difference is whether or not you want to understand it or not. So, well, maybe we should have gone into channel tonight, but since we didn't have the term channel on it tonight, I thought maybe I'll put the book aside and have a little bit of fun and play with channel in, a, in another way. So, Thank you very much for an opportunity to play. And uh, as I say, this great book called The Collected Works of Chunnel is a very fine piece of work. And I recommend it to you. And my old teacher, Miao Bang, will certainly chuckle when he hears about it. Korean Buddhism, by the way, used to be called The Great Secret because everybody knows about Japanese Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, everybody knows, but Korean Buddhism people don't know about it. So that's the best kept secret in Buddhism, Korean Buddhism. It's the only intellectual one, it's purely intellectual. So, thank you.